Our Father and our God, we stand in Thy presence by means of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. Thankful again for the privilege to open Your precious Word. We recognize, Father, that it, it is the Word of our God. It's the re revelation that You've given to us. May the Holy Spirit teach us stripping away all of that which is ignorant and foolish, sealing truth to our hearts that we may grow in grace and knowledge of You, that we together as members of the body of, of Christ might grow in grace and in the knowledge of You, not ourselves. Guard us from all of that which might blind our eyes to truth. For I ask this in Your name. Amen. We've been studying together, or we started studying together uh, in our uh, Sunday series of uh, videos, the second epistle to the Corinthians, verse by verse. The author is the Holy Spirit. I believe the body of believers at Corinth is, as I pointed out in a previous video, is, is typical it's not the exception. It's typical of all those who call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ in every place. The epistle is dressed, addressed by the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul. Paul merely held the pen, and it was written to a local group of believers who, uh, in the first epistle, they appeared to be rather carnal in their thinking. Uh, not having properly understood nor uh, appropriated the, po the, the position of the believer in this present age. I've always believed and suggested that theological error precedes moral error. They were reigning as kings when they should have been suffering as servants. Uh, they should have recognized that the true messenger of the Lord Jesus Christ is despised. He's the off-scouring of the world religious system. They were insisting upon their own rights rather than, than showing love for one another, as well as many other things. And we looked at, at all of those things when we went through the first epistle. I find it interesting that the second epistle opens with the subject of suffering. Well, it actually opens with grace and peace, but we're looking at suffering right, right away. And, and all but three chapters in this epistle have suffering someplace in the context of that chapter. Uh, those are uh, chapters 3, 9, and 10. Other than that, every other, other chapter has some mention of suffering and I, I think that's a, extremely important. It's not fun to talk about suffering, but I think you'll enjoy this. I hope you do. We see the concern that the Apostle Paul had for the believers at Corinth, and when he he didn't meet when he didn't meet Titus, he went looking for him. And and by the time that you get to the seventh chapter, you see the great rejoicing that he had. And that rejoicing was based uh, not upon the fact that, that uh, you know, that they, they bought him a new pickup truck or that they decided to donate some, some vast sum of money to build his radio station, you know, where he could reach all of Palestine and, you know, the, the Middle East or whatever or some other thing, but that these believers had turned to the Lord with their whole heart and they understood that the message that the Holy Spirit had sent to them. And that was a cause of great rejoicing to Paul. And I've, I've got to confess that uh, to you that that kind of rejoicing is pretty rare in my personal experience. I've I haven't found very many missionaries or ministers or, or Bible teachers who uh, greatly rejoice because 
some group of carnal believers were touched by the word of truth and it had a, a undeniable effect in their lives. I'm not, I'm not saying it doesn't happen. It, happen, it happens here. I, I know that it's happened here. I, uh, I receive messages like that and I rejoice in that. But it does not seem to be the primary concern today. The second epistle opens with the subject of suffering and apparently, as we'll see, and I should have already seen, uh, but didn't, that it's the grand theme of the epistle. And yet many Christians that I've talked to over the years are absolutely persuaded that, that God did not does not expect us to suffer and that the only real reason the only viable cause for suffering is sin and and if there's suffering in your life it's because there's sin in your life you know you've done something wrong so only if there's no sin in your life are you always victorious and that is not true he always causes us to triumph. The truth that I wish many believers would really camp hard on. Now there's cases in which you're gonna suffer for sin, like, you know, well, if you, you know, drive a hundred miles an hour down the highway and you get caught, you know, and they throw you in jail for uh, reckless driving. You know, I imagine that's uh, the natural result of what you, you did, but that's not suffering as a Christian. Uh, the context here and of course God will work that out for good in your life he works all things together for the good but most Christians today are absolutely persuaded that God never intended us to suffer that you know there's a way out of it there's you know I'll, I'll, that, that there shouldn't be any suffering in our lives and if there is it's because you're not living as you ought to live and there's a popular acceptance of a, a, a gospel that Jesus Christ heals and, and He provides and He gives and, and everything is just super duper, you know, as long as you're okay or as long as you, you know, beg Him, you know, enough to relieve you of your circumstances. If you live the Christian life the way that you ought to, then you, you'd never have an ache You'd never have a pain. You'd never get tired. You'd never be discouraged. Nothing, okay? Uh, nothing would ever go wrong until you, well, until you fell down and you couldn't get up, and you know, and you'd go to heaven, and that'd just be a marvelous way to, to live. But that is obviously contrary to the Word of God. It's contrary to normal experience. And, and it's contrary to the experience of those in the world. Paul's life wasn't that way. In the book of Acts, chapter 14, verse 22, we're told that the disciples, the apostles, went around exhorting the Christians every day uh, that with much suffering, they're going to enter into the kingdom of God. I think it'd be impossible to separate suffering from the Christian experience. Folks, it's necessary. I'm absolutely persuaded that you can't know what faith is until you suffer. You know, if I, I pointed this out before, I've said this on numerous occasions. If I had billions of dollars, and if I had the power to solve all of your problems, you know, your, your business problems, problems, your health problems, the, the, uh, the loss of your hair, you know, your marital problems, whatever, whatever it is, you know, I do it. I do it. God has the means to do it and he doesn't. There's got to be a reason for that. You know, surely the God of the word is a God of love. He's a God of concern, a God of compassion, 
I believe it's Satan that causes Christians to entertain the insidious thought that, well, you know, God's done something to them because, you know, he enjoys seeing them suffer. You wouldn't believe the number of Christians that believe that nonsense. And such a concept has, has got to be contrary to the Word of God. I believe it actually pains the heart of God more than it ever pained you. And if it were not for your 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 good and 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 for mine, it, it wouldn't happen. You don't want me to be God, okay? Me, I'd make everything a mess. I'd just, you know. I, and that by I'd make everything I'd make everything perfect in your life, you know, and I'd be wrong, and I'd wind up you know, with a, a bunch of spoiled brats who have no idea what it means to trust God, to believe in God, and to be patient and to wait. You know, when the picture in the Word of God is to trust God above all things, believe Him, long ago I became persuaded that until God knocks out one of my props, you know, I don't know what it means. I won't know what it means to trust Him. You know, when the when the bank account's big and, and the job is good and and you know uh, and it looks secure, everything and I'm feeling fine. You know, it's marvelous to sing Hallelujah to the Lord every morning and and tell him how much you know I love him, how much I appreciate all that he's done and he's doing, how much and how much I trust him, you know. And then some tragedy strikes in my life. And I put that tragedy in quotes. And so I'm certain that there is a God-ordained purpose in suffering. However, we come to the fifth verse. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. And whether we be afflicted it is for your consolation and salvation which is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer. Whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. And our hope of you is steadfast, knowing that as you are partakers of the sufferings, so shall you be also of the consolation. Those are all present tenses. They're translated in the authorized version as, as though if, you know, if it happens that we're afflicted, it's for your consolation. But the text says that we are, we are afflicted for your consolation and for your deliverance. That's what the text says. It says that this is factual. In the enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer. In other words, there is a, a vital God-ordained purpose in the sufferings of the body of Christ. We know that when one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. In Colossians, Chapter 1, verse 24, Paul says, I rejoice that I can fill up that which is lacking in the sufferings of Christ. Now, what that does not mean is what you hear, hear preached most often today, which is that, well, what really counts is not what Christ did, but what you do. But if you're required, folks, to do one thing, to, to go to glory, just one thing, then what Christ did is ins insignificant because it all hinges on what you do. And, of course, that, that is what I believe, without question, that's what I believe modern, the modern theme of, of evangelism is. It all hinges on what you do. So that's not what Colossians 1.24 says. It does not. Dearly beloved, it does not. You're standing before God. 
depends on what Jesus Christ did. And if, and if we suggest that there is something insufficient or lacking in the work of Christ, then we suddenly have to align ourselves with you know, great segments of Christianity. You know, I speak of, uh, primarily of Roman Catholicism and, and much of Arminianism. And, and I, folks, I don't mean to speak of it critically. I'm simply pointing out that these segments of what is called Christian today place a great emphasis upon what you do. And in the last analysis, your life with God is going to depend on whether or not you were faithful. You know, whether or not you believed, whether or not you received, whether or not you did whatever. Whereas the Scriptures declare that we're going to live together with Him because He died for us. If Jesus Christ died in your place, you're going to live together with Him forever. Now, if all that's true, and I believe it is, then how can there be anything lacking in the afflictions of Christ? It's a question that we need to ponder. Your walk is greatly conditioned upon what you believe and what you do. No one argues that on that. No, nobody will argue that on either side of the fence. Okay, your trust in the Lord. You, know, you are placing your hand in His and walking with Him will have a profound effect upon your daily walk and your life here with Christ. But it will not have any effect on your redemption. Let's just be clear about that. I think it will happen to have an effect upon your reward, but not your redemption. Therefore, I'm also constrained to proclaim trust in Christ as being, well, uh, as long as I, I first proclaim that it's the faith of Christ which redeemed you, and it's your faith in Christ that will have a profound effect upon your walk and your reward. But if what Christ did is not sufficient for redemption, if we are suggesting in this passage that you've got to uh, you must further suffer because Christ didn't do enough, then that's con contrary to what this whole entire book teaches. Many Christians believe that there should be no uh, old man, old self, there, there shouldn't be any carnality in your life or, or, or in a church like Corinth. And I happen to believe that there's, there's some, a little bit of Corinthian carnality in every, every one of us. And in, in every church. And that it's allowed to be there for a purpose. But there wasn't any carnality in Christ. I don't believe that Jesus Christ was afflicted by that, but His body certainly was. And I think that the primary reference to the suffering of the body of Christ is not so much with respect to it's not as much in respect to people and things, really, even though it's that there's that. You know, I have to admit to you that, you know, the Lord Jesus Christ says in John 15 and 16, you know, don't marvel that the world system hates you, for it hated me. You know, that's people. You suffer in relationship to people. And I, and I think that that hatred is directed against the believer. What I'm not suggesting, I'm not suggesting that you don't have any affliction from people. Not suggesting that at all. But what I'm suggesting is that the affliction in, that, that you have, that Christ did not have, is from something else. And I'll talk about that in just a moment.
Christ had affliction from people. You have affliction from people. However, Christ did not have one of the afflictions that you and I have. You do have affliction from a lot of things. If you, uh, if you say what the Scripture says, that He was tempted in all points like as we are now, I, don't, I do not believe, for example, that Jesus Christ was ever tempted to lust after a woman. Uh, some Christians do. I, I, I happen to not. Never. I don't think it ever happened. Thought never entered his mind. So then how could he have been tempted in all points, in all ways, as we are? Because he was tempted in the area of supply. He could, he could speak and he could change rocks into loaves of bread. Didn't eat for 40 days. He was, that's quite an appetite. He was tempted in, in that area. He was, he was tempted in the area of trusting God. But he didn't suffer because of it because he couldn't do anything but trust God. He couldn't do anything but trust the Father. You know, it is written that he shall give charge. Uh, he'll give his angels charge over you. You know, why don't you jump off? You know, so, so he, was, he was tempted in the area of trusting God. And so are you. But there is a difference, folks. There's a difference. Christ was tempted in the, in the same areas in which you are, but He was not tempted in the same way in which you are. Let me ask you this. Do you think Adam could get thirsty? Do you think that he could bleed? You know, do you think that he could get, a, get sick? Before the fall, do you think Adam could, could have gotten sick? Well, no. I, I, don't, I would say no. I think Christ was like Adam before the fall, and Christ never fell. His body did not see corruption, though it was three days in a tomb. Why three days? Why three days in the tomb? Well, dearly beloved, it was to show you and I that it didn't see corruption. Any other human body would have decayed. His did not see corruption. Why? Why did it not see corruption? I believe Christ was absolutely physically dead, but He was God Almighty, okay, incarnate in human flesh. Adam did see corruption because he fell, but before he fell, I don't believe Adam ever, I don't think he ever had the flu, I don't think he could have gotten COVID, or he didn't have a cold or anything else. I think he could be hungry, <coughs> and when he was hungry, you know, he, he ate of all the, the trees of the garden except one. You know, it, I think if you had cut him, I think he would have bled. But he, I think he would have healed. I see nothing wrong with that. But what came as a result of the fall? Corruption. In fact, we have an indication in the Old Testament that part of that is disease as we know it. But the real effect of the fall itself was the fall. I, I can't redeem myself by anything I do. So there was something lacking in the suffering, the sufferings of Christ. And what was lacking is the suffering that we today are experiencing. You and I are experiencing now. We are Christ's body, the church. I believe it's His suffering because we're His body. I believe the church there in that context is the body of Christ, the body of believers. I believe that which is suffering, that which is making up the afflictions of Christ is His body, which is called the church. But, but 
how is it suffering in a way Christ didn't suffer is the question here. That's the question. Well, the authorized version says that which is lacking of the afflictions of Christ. Now, no conservative Bible student wants to say that there's something lacking in what Christ did. I believe what's lacking in what Christ did is the affliction that we endure as His body, as a result of sin. We also suffer in respect to people, but so did, so did Christ. But here, as His body, we suffer in regard to sin, something that He never did in His body. Never. Not once. I don't think there were any pressures that bothered Adam before the fall. He had all the food that he wanted. He had probably had all the fun that he wanted. I guess. I, I don't know. I see no indication that there was anything lacking from a standpoint of things in Adam's experience before the fall. But there sure was plenty afterwards. What are some of the sufferings that relate to people? Well, the Lord Jesus Christ suffered with respect to people. We know He suffered with respect to people. The, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the chief priests, they, they were always there interrogating Him, always trying to catch Him. There was Judas who betrayed Him. There, was, there were His disciples uh, who didn't understand Him or uh, and didn't really trust Him concerning a lot of the things He said. I don't think He wept because Lazarus was dead. I think He wept because of the ignorance and, and the lack of trust of the people that He saw in the people. There was the crowd who cried out, Crucify Him, Crucify Him. You know, who uh, just, just a few days prior to that were saying, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Those things all stem from the attitudes and the actions of people. So that's a suffering. That's, that's suffering that we feel when we feel hated or we, be, we, we become outcast or, or something like that. The Christian today is still put out of the synagogue thinking that, uh, you know, them thinking that they're doing God's service. They're, they're, they're put to death thinking that they offer sacrifice to, to God. That happens even, that still happens today. Those, those things still happen, just like they did, you know, in the day of Christ. Because we're His body. But something else happens that I know I know never happened to Christ. And that is suffering in respect to sin. Self. And you may even say faith. The one thing Christ did not suffer that we suffer is death to self. Death to sin. You know, I'd, I'd kind of probably rule out the suffering in respect to a lack of faith. The faith, as Christ always had, he, he, he couldn't do anything but trust the Father. But faith is a gift of God. But the tough circumstances in our lives designed by God to bring us to the end of ourselves so that we trust in Him and not ourselves is what I believe we make up in the sufferings of Christ. And I think we read that when we... If you go down to verse 8, begin reading at verse 8. For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure, above strength, insomuch that we despaired even of life. But, highlight it, folks, verse 9, but we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God which raiseth the dead, who delivered us from so great a death, and doth deliver, 
in whom we trust that He will yet deliver us. Ye also helping together by prayer for us that for the gift bestowed upon us by the means of many persons, thanks may be given by many on our behalf. Folks, I think that puts us on the right track as we begin this uh, study through 2 Corinthians. I thank you all for participating. I love you all. I truly do. Rest in Him. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.